welcome to the CCTV Time Machine. This is a new program that we're kicking off here at CCTV in which we will take you back through our archive of over 40,000 programs dating back to 1984 and celebrate and reflect on the moments in those programs that capture the remarkable leadership and unique stories of our communities in Vermont. On this show, we'll invite some of the folks that are featured in these archives, uh, which are um, some of which are behind us and many more of which are in closets and other parts of the CCTV studios, uh, invite folks featured in those archives to look back with us, reflect on those moments in our community's uh, history and talk about what's changed since then. So today, we're very lucky to be joined by Gay Symington. Thank you, Gay, for joining us. Gay is a leader in many ways throughout Vermont communities, uh, including as a former Vermont legislator and speaker of the Vermont House. So Gay, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Nice to be here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so OK, we're hopping into the time machine here, Gay. So our first trip in the CCTV time machine, we're traveling back to 2005. Uh, just after the new year. It's the first day of the legislative session in Montpelier, and you were sworn in as Speaker of the House that day. So before we rev up the machine, pull up some of the footage here that we have, what comes to mind for you about that day, if anything? Is there anything you remember specifically? <laughs> well, that day was a blur. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, just, just seeing some of the you know, clip as you were practicing mm -hmm. or getting this ready, I, you know, it's just, you're, I'm looking at people who worked incredibly hard. We were, we were, we had worked so hard as a team to, um, you know, to regain the majority for the Democratic Party that I was part of. And so to see John Tracy, who's speaking and introducing me, uh, you know, um, and, and imagine back that day when it was all ahead of us still, and he mm -hmm. would lead the effort to reform how we paid for health care in Vermont and to make sure everybody um, is, has access to health care. And then he became sort of head of um, Senator Leahy's team in, in the Vermont office. So, um, you know, and, uh, and, and there was a clip in passing of legislator then Sh Shap Smith mm -hmm. and um, Michael Bohosky, who um, had been speaker before me. So, um, you know, it just took a lot of work for that day to come to pass when we could once again elect a Democratic speaker. And um, I was, you know, it was just a real team effort. So it's cool to see some of those yeah. faces and and hear those voices again. Yeah, you've seen about five seconds of the footage so far and you've already <laughs> right. recalled a lot of memories here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hopping in. Okay. Are you ready to, to kind gonna... of travel <laughs> back? Um, here we go. It's January 5th, 2005. We have some serious challenges ahead of us. We all know those. We need a speaker that has the dedication and the intellect to face these problems head on, that acknowledges the individual traits that we have and will be able to bring them together so collectively we can bring out good public policy that will make life better for Vermonters. We need a speaker that has faith in the people that sent us here and trust in our abilities as individuals to work together to make life better. With those traits in mind and with the utmost confidence, it is an honor for me to put forth in nomination the name of Gay Symington for Speaker of the Vermont House of Representatives. Reminiscent of our first cross-hall discussions, I have warned her of the impending headaches of a large majority, looming budgetary problems, and all the rest that she will encounter as speaker. And for some strange reason, she still wants the job. I declare that Gay Symington of Jericho has been elected speaker for the ensuing biennium. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. <laughs> that I will be true and faithful 
that I will be true and faithful to the state of Vermont, to the state I will of support Vermont. the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Today, you have given me a great honor to serve Vermont and to serve you as speaker. And I note that in electing me to serve as the speaker of the Vermont House, you have given me a gavel, not a crown. I accept this position as one of managing a conversation and doing that with respect, with mutual respect. Also, I would like to just remind you that it is, my, it is not my job to decide whether you can speak, but rather when, and, and to manage the timing and the flow as long as we are all um, following the rules of the house. And so I'd like to suggest that we break the habit when you begin to speak of thanking the speaker, but rather just initiate your comments. In this house, power also comes from recognizing that our power is rooted in the trust of our voters. None of us wears a crown. Vermonters have asked us to use our power to strengthen our communities and our families and our businesses by finding a way to ensure that all Vermonters have access to health care, by setting a course that provides our homes and businesses safe and reliable energy, by improving the viability and strength and diversity of our rural economy, and by setting forward a budget that lives up to our responsibilities without asking our children to pay the bills for services and infrastructure that we want the benefit of today. Our work in this house requires that we reach outside ourselves, outside our individual experiences, beyond the distinctions that determine our differences and define our uniqueness, to find the common values and to strengthen our state community. I am honored and grateful to have been elected to guide the house, to guide that, our work in this, the People's House. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> I was, I, so putting this clip together and going through all the footage of your time in the House and your leadership gay is really emotionally impactful for me and um, just made me really grateful for you know all the, all the work that you did and the way that you approached that work. Um, I know it's kind of bizarre to watch footage <laughs> <laughs> of yourself from a while ago um, so I really appreciate you coming in and and looking back with us. Um, what emotions, what memories come up for you when or revisiting that day? Well, it is a blur, <laughs> um, but I, and it is the people to see, you know, as I mentioned, John Tracy, Carolyn Partridge, who I turned, you know, who I also hugged, she led, she was the majority leader. Uh, Floyd Neese was in that picture too as the assistant leader. And, you know, we had, we had big goals and, um, and we had worked really hard to try to change the, to be in a position of power. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was a day of promise. And, and then the, the member from Orwell, who I'm embarrassed to say that I'm <laughs> forgetting his name, but he was a Republican mm -hmm. um, and he took eternal grief for having seconded my nomination <laughs> <laughs> throughout the two years. Um, but he, he was very gracious and I really appreciated the fact that there was, you know, that we were making a statement by having a Democrat and a Republican, um, you know, make those, nom make the nominations. Um, I believe there was a third, but I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so I won't speak for whether there was a progressive um, who also chimed in. But, um, you know, it was just a, it was, uh, and then to see my children who are much older now, <laughs> um, you know, and Deb Markowitz, who was, um, had been um, Secretary of State, but, and, 
Deb had used that role and used her position of leadership to really encourage women throughout the state to run for office. There wasn't an organization that we now call Emerge at the time. Mm -hmm. And Deb really um, put a lot of effort into making the point that women really need to be invited into the state house and, uh, I mean, to think of themselves in roles of leadership and, to, and uh, consider being in leadership. And so it was very meaningful to have her be uh, the, you know, the, the um, Secretary of State mm -hmm. uh, to administer the oath of office. Right. Right. Um, you know, I remember that uh, very well. Um, and it was packed. The State House was packed. It was you know, packed. It, it, um, the previous time a woman had been speaker was the year I was born, which was a mm -hmm. long time ago, <laughs> 1954. <laughs> um, you know, Consuela Bailey was the first woman speaker um, in Vermont. And, and the year that I was speaker, there were only two women speakers. In, I was one of only two in the whole country mm -hmm. um, who were in the State House. So, and then my second term, there were six. Um, and you know, it's hard to remember, it's hard to imagine that now because most of the leadership in the State House now um, are women. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The speaker, the majority leader, the minority leader, the chairs of money committees. Um, it, that feels familiar uh, now, but it was not. Um, so it was, it was an honor. Um, yeah. You, um, so we're in 2005. You have the chance to offer some advice to a uh, gay who's just been sworn in and has a lot of work ahead of her. What would you, what advice would you offer? Well, I had offered myself advice at the time. <laughs> uh, I had stickers in front of me, a sticker in front of me that uh, would say, um, breathe, <laughs> <laughs> think, uh, Li no, breathe, listen, think, and then speak in progressively mm -hmm. smaller font. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the title was speaker, mm -hmm. uh, but actually I, I mostly listened, right. you know. It, uh, it, was, it was mostly the members of the house who were speak speaking, and my role was to be a facilitator. So I would, again, use that advice right. <laughs> um, of, you know, uh, <laughs> listen first. Right. Um, and take a deep breath, which would be my father's advice to me. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it, yeah, I think that would still be my advice. Yeah. yeah, your colleagues made the position of speaker sound pretty difficult. <laughs> uh, involves setting the table for a discussion and listening and sometimes setting aside maybe your perspective or um, in some ways, the desires of the you know district of Vermonters that you represent, in order to serve the the whole state and set the table for conversations about statewide decisions and investments. How did you uh, how did you try to accomplish that? Uh, you know, did you have to kind of separate your own sort of opinions and and perspectives as a legislator from the task of setting the table and, and, and sort of laying the tasks out for the, the, the state as a whole? Well, you can't disengage. Yeah. <laughs> um, you need to respond, you know, in your voting. I would need to respond to myself and look at myself in the mirror and be comfortable with votes. Um, and, um, you know, I had my constituency of the three, at the time it was three towns that I represented. Um, and I had a party caucus to be responsive to. And in that position, I had the whole house. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's I remember the, some of the hardest work of the speaker happens in the very first days of the session. Uh, in, there's a lot of power in the position, in the position of speaker in that, that uh, in Vermont, um, that position is vested with uh, assigning the, the committees right. and choosing the leadership of the committees. Um, that's not the same in all states. And um, I, but that's a, t while it's a position 
while it's vested in the position, I, I don't know of a speaker. Certainly, I wasn't going to do that alone. Um, you know, it's very much conferring with the minority leadership about the desires of their uh, committees, uh, I mean, th their members, and where would be the right place, and figuring out, our, you know, is there our diverse representation on different committees? Um, do we have committees that's do too dominated by one county mm -hmm. or another? Um, I know that I was very conscious of, I remember being conscious of being a Chittenden County uh, leader, and um, I had, and there were quite a few leaders who um, were from Chittenden County, um, Representative Heath of Appropriations, Representative Tracy, Healthcare, Representative Ann Pugh um, in the Health and Human Services. Um, there were others, and, and so I was, and I was conscious about, you know, making sure that there was a balance, and there were representatives from more rural parts of the state, and. Um, so, you know that anyway. There was there's that's but that all got crunched gets crunched mm. into the very mm -hmm. first couple of days right. of the session, and then you need you know it's a matter of letting the committees do their work mm. and be, being judicious about when you step in and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember what we promised? <laughs> Does the so. speaker visit any committee? Like when everybody goes off to their committees. Where do you go? To my to the speaker's office, and the speaker's office is where um, you know I would, as I recall, there were um, visitors to the state house would stop by the speaker's office. Certainly, lobbyists wanted to understand you know where their what the process was and who they should speak to about a particular set of goals. There were a couple times when I'd appear at, at the door of a committee and. You know, <laughs> The committee chair would go, oops, just a minute. <laughs> um, but that was rare, you know. Uh, and mostly I was trying to figure out, you know, I'm getting this information from outside the room. I'd rather hear, I'd rather, you know, get it. But I didn't, I didn't, as I recall, sit in committee rooms. Right. Um, I wasn't a member of a policy committee. I was on the rules committee. Um, yeah, so... Right. It okay. is. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, I also remember it could, you could feel isolated in the speaker's office. Mm -hmm. And there was a previous speaker, not, uh, I think it was quite a f few years before my time, had renovated the speaker's office and created a bathroom at the speaker's office. And I made a conscious choice to use the restroom, the, you know, down the hall because it would allow me to walk through <laughs> yeah. the cafeteria and run into people. Mm -hmm. And a lot happens in the bathrooms of the legislators. <laughs> I can find out a lot. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> okay, so we have one more stop on the, on the time machine journey here. We're going uh, forward a few years to 2008. So you had a public access TV show that aired on CCTV. It was called Inside Your State House. And we have all of those shows saved here at CCTV. So let's jump into one of those episodes from uh, March 2008, I think. And this is a show um, you hosted, which often featured your colleagues in the legislature to talk about bills that were moving forward. Um, the episode that we're going to take a look at is a little bit different. Um, you invited a group of legislative interns into your office to share what they were learning. Um, so. You ready to take a look? Okay, great. So we have um, one more clip here. Simington, and I'm Speaker of the Vermont House. Uh, this is a weekly um, uh, taping that we do in my office in the State House to help Vermonters have a view into their State House and have a sense of some of what goes on in the State House in Vermont. This is really your State House, and 
uh, and I usually devote the, the, I, each of the half hour segments to one of the major topics that have been moving through. This week I'm here, lucky enough to be here with a bunch of young ladies who have been in the State House and throughout this uh, session they are all um, members of Girl Scouts and they have been um, mentoring or shadowing uh, different legislators in the House and the Senate um, and learning about what's going on in the State House and, uh, and what happen how state government works and what some of its quirks are and one of some of its um, uh, characteristics that maybe we all don't learn in civics classes. <laughs> and um, it's just, I think the reason I come back every year is because every year it gets bigger and bigger, it's expanding. The first year I was here, I think we had six times we were here. And um, this year we have much more than that. And next year it's constantly expanding. And this year we got to go to the UN, which is really big. And um, I'm sure next year it's going to be even bigger, especially with Carmel. And um, I'm just uh, looking forward to it. That's why I really want to come back. Right. And like before going to the UN, I thought that gender inequality was completely based on like a person's own unwillingness or inability to fight back, and they were just kind of letting it happen to them. And then I went and I really got my eyes opened <laughs> to everything that's going on, and it really inspired me because I know there's so many people out there that are like, wait, what? Gender inequality? It's like no such thing. And now that I know it, like, really is a problem. Hmm. It's interesting. That's great that it inspired you as opposed to made you frustrated. Right. Inspired you to to really pay attention to right, it and, and like try change to change things in my community, uh -huh. in my school, and in great. Vermont, and community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I realize Vermont's great. I mean, we have a female speaker of the House, <coughs> and we have the largest percent of females in the legislature. But then you look at states. I remember I was looking through the percents, and I was joking with my mom. South Carolina has 8% females. And I'm like, if we could start this program in a state like South Carolina, then, I mean, we'd really make a difference. And mm -hmm. I think as interns, we really want to see it grow and expand to other states. So uh, it's great to have you all in the State House um, to remind us that our obligations and our responsibilities go beyond just the here and now, but also the state budgets that you'll all be juggling when you're elected to serve in your communities in the State House. So thanks a lot for joining me today and for uh, being in the State House on a regular basis. It's great to have so many girls in the State House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So that clip, as I mentioned, is a little bit irregular compared to the other shows that you typically have. We didn't want to get too in the weeds on some of the issues that you were talking about uh, back in 2008. But uh, this, I think, conversation um, exemplified a little bit of the um, conversation that you were thrown into as the second you know, woman to be elected speaker. And um, you know, I, I, I know you mentioned some of the progress that's been made in uh, pursuit of gender equity in our state's leadership since then. Um, but you also mentioned that there's a lot left to do. Um, you know, and, and yeah, I just wonder if this brings up any, any um, memories or reflections for you about um, the experience of being a woman in, in that position of power and how that experience has changed in the last 20 years. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me just a, again of that effort that so many, what, this was the Girl Scouts, it was a program they had initiated and, um, and there were other times when women would come in, it, sometimes it was women from other countries, um, you know, uh, sometimes it was just a family or a mom. I, I, you know, there were, it was just a very regular experience to have, to be stopped by a, a woman who was with her daughter and ask, could she introduce me to her daughter? because. Um, you know, it, it, it mattered for, uh, for girls to see women in those roles. And you can't be what you can't see. Um, you know, one of my mentors, Liz Benkowski, used to always say. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it just was true. Um, and so, and, you know, Senator Doyle, of, then of Washington County, would often have students, uh, he taught, um, 
civics and history um, at Johnson State and co college, which is no longer called that, <laughs> um, but he would often bring his class um, into the state house, and you know, and I would have the chance to meet with them. So it wasn't always girls only or exclusively women, um, but. It was it was very much a process. The speaker takes on a role of in, in a way of being the ambassador for the state and welcoming people into the state house. Um, and I I found one of uh, you know I, I worked hard to be um, of to to help girls and young women see themselves in the roles of the state house, but also that it was important for people to recognize that they don't have to have been decided to be a politician <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in order to serve in the state house. You know, uh, constantly people would say to me, and of both genders, um, I can't serve in this, I would never run for election because I, I don't like conflict, I don't like speaking in public, I don't, um, you know, I don't know enough. And they would have this long litany, and I would say back to them, one, the role of being in the legislature is mostly about listening and working one-on-one -on -one with people. It's not about pounding the table and making important speeches. I mean, certainly there are wonderful speeches that have been made, but it's in the State House, but it is mostly about finding common ground and listening really hard mm -hmm. uh, for that common ground and finding a path forward through differences. and. Um, and do we, and if you are, if that's those are the reasons that you and others stay out of the state house or don't run for election, then who does that lead mm -hmm. leave for running for office? The people who do like conflict, the people who love to hear themselves speak, the people you know who think they have all the answers. Is that who you want as your politicians? I don't think so. Those of us who are turned off by politics at usual as usual. It really matters that we join the conversation and run for office. Yeah. And so I often found myself in those kinds of conversations with people. Right. Yeah. So you um, had this show, and um, as I mentioned, would have legislators on to kind of parse out a conversation that was happening at the state house. Do any of those kinds of conversations on this show come to mind? Any episodes? Um, or about you know certain issues where you had a conversation um, that um, you know I, I guess stuck out or, or f that you felt was uh, you know captured the issue well. I uh, I can't say that I remember. <laughs> uh, I in terms of the specifically that you know speaking in this context, I think the conversation that we were mostly having was. Around healthcare, mm -hmm. um, that what you know, and and clean energy, um, those were, I think, of those mm -hmm. as leading. I mean, certainly there were also issues about the rural economy, access to broadband. I mean, there are familiar issues, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, balancing the budget, mm -hmm. um, uh, but making sure Vermont, all Vermonters had access to high quality healthcare was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was high on the list, and at in that second clip in 2008, that was where we were moving towards um, adva advancing from civil unions to consider marriage equality. And I had appointed, we had appointed a um, commission on marriage uh, at that point, uh, Senator Shumlin, who was the president pro tem of the Senate at the time, and I uh, had, um, uh, made that appointment and begun the conversation to look at, um, you know, where was it that civil unions were falling short and not serving mm -hmm. um, our LGBT, you know, Vermonters well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the legislation wouldn't pass until 2009, but certainly the conversation had begun. And um, so there's, there's the headlines, conversations, healthcare, clean energy, climate change, mm -hmm. um, but there are affordable housing, right. you know. Right. Um, and then there's also the beginning to set the table for conversations that really still need to, that we know still need to happen. Right. 
you chose to have this show or you invited folks on to talk about these issues, fast forwarding now back into 2023, we're in a very different media environment. Where, if at all, do you see these kinds of conversations or the current iteration of these conversations that were happening on this show that you had playing out now with respect to the issues, a lot of which are similar to the issues or the same as the issues that you were working on um, then? Uh, are they on social media? You know, do you see them playing out more um, in other places? You know, what, what do these conversations look like now? What takes the role of, because it's frankly as much as I would love for it to be, you know, a robust, uh, you know, uh, a lot of public access TV shows, it's not, <laughs> um, the yeah. current speaker doesn't have a public access TV show. And, and so where, where do you see the, you know, the opportunity for those conversations to take place now? Yeah. Well, the current speaker helped me set up those conversations <laughs> because she worked with me at the time so in the speaker's office. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I, I do have a Twitter account. I do uh, fo follow conversations on Twitter. Um, but a part of why I had those shows is was my nature. I was a po I had been a policy wonk, and I, um, you know, I used to have um, Peter Frain, who was associated with CCTV, used to constantly. Uh, I don't know what the right verb is, but argue comes to mind, <laughs> or mentor me, or, you know, if he could, he would have strangled me, to say, what's the one thing, you know, what's the one thing, and what's the, that you want to have happen, and mm -hmm. I would say, and what's the one important message, and I'd say, Peter, you know, there's a lot, it, it, there's, it, it, I can't boil it down, and I don't know that it should be boiled down mm -hmm. to one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but Twitter does make you boil it down to one thing. So I, I think that, um, you know, people need to be drawn in and hear the breadth of conversation. And I think that happens um, sometimes. It's still there. You can hear it um, sometimes on public radio, I, you know, or I, whatever we're just supposed to, Vermont Public. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, but I also think it, what is happening is at, in libraries, at mm -hmm. general stores, you know, um, legislators set aside time to listen to, uh, before town meeting or on town meeting. I know you can, you know, the legislators I follow are, well, I just was in Craftsbury and now I'm headed to, you know, Greensboro. Catherine Sims or, you know, whoever it, it is, but they're, they're, that's what they do on that whole town meeting week is a lot of listening back in communities and, uh, and try to help, and they put out, you know, newsletters. They're not, they do that to invite people in, to say mm -hmm. this is a little more about what we're thinking about and why mm -hmm. I, and I'd love to hear, hear what you have to say. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, people are busy, so it's hard for people to weigh in but it does, when they do, it really does matter. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also, I think that when we have issues that are, you know, we had dealt with civil unions, we were moving towards marriage equality before civil unions, there had been, um, you know, really tough votes about uh, making sure that gay and lesbian Vermonters could adopt for example, and become parents. And civil unions built on that. Mm -hmm. And then marriage equality built on that. And then gender identity, you know, it's, mm -hmm. those conversations need to keep coming and they can feel, um, you know, we can feel it, it, what matters in those cases, I think, is for Vermonters to share their, have the courage to share their personal story Mm -hmm. and for Vermonters to have the courage to listen to stories that are beyond their own experience and that their life experience and realize what, um, you know, why some of these issues matter uh, to people whose lives are very different from theirs. Mm -hmm. And 
that's the kind of listening that legislators do, and they and um, you know finding forums for pulling people in is really important. Mm -hmm. Pulling people into the conversation. And my concern with you know social media is it it enables us to go into our separate camps mm -hmm. and speak to an echo chamber as opposed to speaking to people whose life experience or just opinions differ from ours and do it in a way that's civil mm -hmm. and so that we can listen, both listen and talk. Um, and that's a tricky balance, you know, that's just tricky balance. That's tricky. We're thinking about it all the time here as well as we figure out how to set up conversations that enable, you know, good listening and dialogue without Right. Um, without causing anyone to be harmed or perpetuating any sort of systemic violence, of which there is a lot out there. Um, but great, thank you so much, Gay, for coming on this sort of experimental episode of the CCTV Time Machine. I think that's going to wrap it up for for this episode. So uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope that you'll. Uh, Join us again next time as we sift through the CCTV archives and revisit the moments and stories that built our communities in Vermont. Thanks so much for watching and have a great night. Mm -hmm.